Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis 29. I enjoy doing character studies and have done quite a bit in the past. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at Leah. Leah the Unloved. Genesis 29. Genesis 29 and verse 13. So when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Then he related to Laban all these things. This is regard to Jacob coming to get a wife in his uh, homeland and sent there by his uh, parents. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and face. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than to give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my time is completed that I may go into her. Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. Now in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him, and Jacob went into her. Laban also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? But Laban said, it is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also for the service which you will serve with me for another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week, and he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. Laban also gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban for another seven years. Now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuben, for she said, Because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. So she named him Simeon. She conceived again. And bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, she named him Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah and she stopped bearing. Now, when Rachel saw that she saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous of her sister. And she said to Jacob, give me children or I die. Then Jacob's ang anger burned against Rachel, and he said, Am I the place of God? Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? She said, Here is my maid Bilhah. Go into her that she may bear on my knees, that through her I too may have children. So she gave him her maid Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Jacob said, God has vindicated me and has indeed heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she named him Dan. Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again, and she bore Jacob a second son. So Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and I have indeed prevailed. And she named him Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took her maid Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, how fortunate. So she named him Gad. Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, happy am I, for women will call me happy. And she named him Asher. We're going to stop there. It's quite the story, isn't it? The Bible is very unsentimental and forthright in the topic of marriage. 
it's very realistic that marriage is difficult. For many, it is hard not to be married, and it's also hard to be married. Most Old Testament marriages recorded, when they talk about them to any degree, have a degree of difficulty involved with them. The Bible shows marriage both in its strengths and in its difficulties, especially in the Old Testament. Well, here we have Leah deceptively married off to Jacob, who loved her sister, not her. Now, maybe Laban was worried that Leah would never get married because she was not attractive. We don't really know his true motive because he also liked the fact that Jacob worked for him for seven years, so I'm not sure which had more importance to him. But it says in uh, Genesis 29, 17, that Leah's eyes were weak. In the context of the passage, now we don't know what that means exactly, but Leah was not a pretty girl. Maybe she had some kind of eye disease, such as being cross-eyed or protruding eyes. Or maybe she just wasn't as pretty as Rachel. It doesn't say. But she was not pretty like Rachel was. And Leah had to live with Jacob, who did not love her. That had to be extremely difficult. Jacob wanted to be with Rachel, not Leah. And Jacob wanted to confide with Rachel, not Leah. Jacob admired Rachel, not Leah. Leah felt rejected and unloved and unwanted, and used. In this drama of Jacob's marriage to both Leah and Rachel, we learn about the realities of marriage, love, jealousy, and multi-generational sin. The outline for this message today is, be sure your sins will find you out. Number two, in the morning, it's always Leah. Number three, the results of jealousy. And number four, yearning for love. First of all, be sure your sins will find you out. You've heard the phrase, what goes around comes around. Jacob had a legacy of deceit, and now he's going to pay for it. He met his match in Laban. Laban had more years of experience, and obviously he used that experience. Jacob had deceived his father Isaac to steal Esau's blessing. Jacob's father-in-law Laban deceived Jacob about marrying Rachel. When you sin, it is not an action with temporary consequences that goes away. Timothy Keller says this about sin. You never do sin, sin does you. You never commit sin, sin commits you. The Bible says that when you do sin, you don't do just sin as an event and then pass on. You create and you release a devastating power that careens around your life indefinitely. Jacob knew what that meant, didn't he? You have to look at his definition. Obviously, we all do sin, but sin then really does us. You never do sin. Sin does you. You never commit sin. Sin commits you. The Bible says that when you do sin, you don't do just an event and then pass on. You create and you release a devastating power, <clears throat> excuse me, that careens around your life indefinitely. Sin grows <clears throat> and multiplies and infects and destroys. And it's interesting that we have numerous examples of sin sown and sin reaped in the families of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have numerous examples of sin sown and sin reaped in the families of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They reaped what they sowed. Think about this, reaping in the doubting. Sarah doubted God's promise of a son, so convinced Abraham to mate with Hagar so she could have a surrogate son. Rachel, her granddaughter, convinced Jacob to mate with her maid, Bilhah, so she could have a sur surrogate son just like Sarah. Worked out real well for both of them, didn't it? Reaping in the father. 
Jacob deceived his father concerning Esau's blessing. And he was in turn deceived by his father-in-law, reaping in the oldest. Jacob's deception of his father involved the oldest son. The oldest daughter of Laban was involved in Jacob being deceived. Reaping in the kissing. Jacob kissed Isaac deceitfully, for Isaac thought it was Esau kissing him. Leah kissed Jacob decept deceptively, for Jacob thought it was Rachel kissing him. Reaping in the favorite. Jacob deceived his father on his favorite son. Laban deceived Jacob about his favorite daughter. Reaping in the collaborating. Jacob had worked with his mother to deceive Isaac. Leah worked with her father to deceive Jacob. What goes around comes around. Reaping in the ignorance. Isaac thought he was blessing Esau when he blessed Jacob. Jacob thought he was sleeping with Rachel when he was sleeping with Leah. Reaping in the feast. Jacob used a special feast to deceive his father. Laban used a feast to help deceive Jacob. Reaping in the birthright. Jacob stole his brother, brother's birthright. Jacob got deceived because of Leah's birthright. Reaping in the deceiving. Jacob deceived his father, stealing Esau's blessing. Laban deceives Jacob, substituting his, his older daughter for Rachel. We reap what we sow. And our children reap what we sow. And our grandchildren reap what we sow. The sins of the father pass on to the children and to grandchildren. Abraham deceived Abimelech about his, Sarah, his wife. Isaac did the same with Rebekah, his wife. Jacob deceives Isaac to steal Esau's blessing. Jacob's sons deceived him about Joseph, about his death. David committed adultery. His sons followed with their own immorality. God says concerning sin, for I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And then he says again in Exodus 34, who keeps loving kindness for thousands and forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Exodus 34, 7. The sins of the father have serious consequences for a long time. Parents and grandparents, do you want your sin to affect your children and your grandchildren? It applies to all of us. Sin is ugly, and it just doesn't go away. How do you avoid that sin? Or what sin are you sowing in your life which may stumble your children and their children? Pride, that's a pretty common one. Cheating, lying, gossip, greed, rebellion against authority, jealousy, lack of faith, and you can go on and on. Be careful what you're doing. The answer to avoid sin's devastation in your family is confess that sin immediately. Do not, it let, do not let it take root in your family. Confess it immediately. Be sure your sin will find you out in your life, in your grandchildren's lives, in your children's lives, just like it did with Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Well, not only do we have to worry about our sins finding us out, then it's interesting. It says in the morning, it was Leah. In the morning, it's always Leah. Life on earth is full of disappointment, as Jacob and Leah both learned. Jacob was greatly anticipating, anticipating marrying J Rachel, the love of his life, after working seven years for her. That was a long time. And it says they were but a day to him because he loved her so much. But in the morning, it was Leah he had married, not Rachel, whom he loved with all his heart. No matter what your hopes are for regarding marriage, career, projects or whatever, in the morning it is Leah or disappointment because nothing ultimately satisfies outside of Christ. Young people hope for a good marriage, for a good career, for a life that's fulfilled. C.S. Lewis says this regarding hope. 
most people, if they really learn to look into their heart, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never keep their promise. The longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or first think of some foreign country or first take up some subject that excites us are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can ever really satisfy. I am not speaking of that which ordinarily would be called unsuccessful marriages or failures of holidays and so on. I'm speaking of the very best possible ones. There's always something we have grasped at. There's always something at the first moment of longing but fades away in the reality. The spouse may have been a very good spouse. The scenery may have been very excellent. It may have turned out to be a good job, but it evaded us in the morning. It's always Leo. I cannot imagine Jacob's disappointment and surprise at finding out he had married Leah, not Rachel. And I cannot imagine Leah's disappointment at being rejected and unloved by Jacob. Not only is Leah married to a man who does not love her, he loves her sister who uses Jacob's love for her against Leah. Not a good situation. We live in a world of unhappy people with unfulfilled expectations in life, in marriage, in jobs, in children, and so on and so forth. Without hope, they turn to drugs, alcohol, wealth, sports, whatever. Does your life have disappointments and unfulfilled expectations? Maybe in marriage, maybe in family, children, friendships, church, job, recognition, unrealized goals, health problems, monetary problems, all people experience disappointment, unfulfilled expectations, don't they, in this world? But the problem is that we look for ultimate and complete satisfaction and happiness in the wrong places. Only God can satisfy, and he can satisfy in the midst of these challenges. It says in Isaiah 55, Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourself in abundance, Isaiah 55, 2. Christ said, I am coming that he may have life, and they may have it abundantly, John 10, 10. Look for the ultimate and eternal happiness in Christ alone, only he can deliver. Regarding this world, in the morning, it is always Leah. Now, obviously, we as Christians have better marriages, uh, better lives because of our um, salvation in Christ. But even those things compare, are pale in comparison to who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. And it's good for us to keep that in perspective. Well, sometimes life's disappointments lead us to jealousy. Jealousy between people can be harmful to themselves, harmful to their families, and harmful to the family of God. Leah was jealous of Rachel, being loved by Jacob. Rachel was jealous of Leah's children, very jealous. Jealousy causes irrational and ungodly reactions. Listen to this. Rachel tells Jacob, give me children or I die. Now, how was Jacob going to figure into that? We know he could have children. Leah had children. But... She was very unhappy. Give me children or I die, as if he was the problem or the solution. The jealousy and rivalry between Leah and Rachel was so intense, both prevailed upon Jacob to have children via their handmaids to get one up on the other. Is that stupid or what? You talk about being causing irrational, ungodly reactions. And then justifying. Rachel gives her maid to Jacob as wife so she could have a surrogate children by Bila, just like her grandmother or great-grandmother uh, Sarah did. Leah counters, got to keep up with them, you know, by giving her maid Zilpah to Jacob as a wife. Now there are four women instead of two competing in this circle of jealousy. 
Can you imagine having four ongoing task lists instead of one with all four wanting theirs done first? Can you imagine four women striving for Jacob's favor and attention? Jealousy was rampant in Jacob's house, and I'm pretty sure Jacob spent most of his time in the field <laughs> where he can find peace from jealous wives. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but I'm really pretty sure. And it's interesting to me that rationalization of motive typically comes with jealousy. Both Rachel and Leah felt vindicated by the Lord in giving their handmaids to Jacob. Now, was it God's will for them to do that? No, obviously not. But they felt vindicated by the Lord. Rachel rationalized that God approved of her carnal action. She says, God has vindicated me and has heard my voice and given me a son. That is a surrogate son by her handmaid. God has vindicated me. Had God vindicated me? No. She thought he had. Rachel rationalized God was on her side. And she said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister, and I have indeed prevailed. This is when the second surrogate son was born. Well, Leah rationalizes her countermeasure of giving her maid to Jacob, evidenced by the names she gave her maid son. How fortunate and happy am I. Just because you get the result you are looking for, does not do not assume it was God's will. We have that trouble in life. In life. Things turn out like we want. Oh, that must have been God's will. It wasn't here. Because just because they get the results you're looking for, don't assume it was God's will. It was not in this case. Consider Sarah's surrogate son, Ishmael, and how that turned out for Israel. She thought it was God's will until she had her own son. And then she realized this is not so good. Israel's been paying for Sarah's lack of faith as descendants of Ishmael continue to harass Israel. The results of jealousy are evil and animosity. It says in Romans chapter 13, Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, and not in strife and jealousy. Jealousy does not become the child of God. I think this verse describes the home of Jacob. It's in the New Testament, James 3.16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder at every evil thing. There was certainly disorder in Jacob's house. And sometimes jealousy happens in the church, which is why Paul wrote in this verse, I urge Eodia and Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Believers can have jealousy toward other believers whether it be their wealth, their spiritual gift, their children, their job, their looks, their success, whatever. And they can rationalize their jealousy away, convincing themselves they are not jealous. Although jealousy is often exposed by what they say about other people that they're jealous about. Rachel and Leah's jealousy toward each other made life miserable for them, for Jacob, and for their children. Jealousy solves no problems and creates other problems. Guilt, rationalization, ruined relationships, bitterness, and on and on. We as believers have to be on guard against jealousy. We need to confess that jealousy immediately before it is out of hand like it was with Leah and Rachel, causing irreparable damage in their families. It says in James 3.16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. It behooves us to look in our heart and make sure we're not jealous of somebody else and that we are looking to the Lord only. Well, we looked at jealousy. Last of all, I want to look at yearning for love. Wives, understandably, desire the affection of their husbands. They should. Leah wanted the love and affection of her husband, Jacob, very much. Solomon wrote this about the unloved woman. Under three things, the earth quakes, and therefore it cannot bear up. Under a slave, when he becomes king, and a fool, when he is satisfied with food. Under an unloved, unloved woman, when she gets a husband, and a maidservant, when she supplants her mistress. 
Proverbs 30. Leah anticipated that Jacob would love her, but he did not. And Leah names her sons to reveal her struggle for Jacob's love. The names of her sons describe what was going on in her mind and life as she yearned for her husband's affection. Reuben was her first son. And Reuben means looked upon or see. Leah thanks God for seeing her affliction, anticipating being loved by Jacob because of their son together. Because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. Children were very important in that day and age. And she had a child, a man child. And typically the man would have been very proud of that, very happy. We don't know exactly what Jacob's reaction was, but it was certainly did not meet her expectations. Simeon, the second son, means hearing. Leah thanks God for hearing her affliction, anticipating that Jacob will love her now that she has had two sons. It says in Genesis 29, 33, because the Lord has heard that I am in love, he is therefore giving me this son also. The Lord had heard, the Lord had seen, the Lord had heard. And the third son, Levi, means joined or attached. Leah anticipates that Jacob will become attached to her because she has given him three sons. And she says in Gen Genesis 29, 34, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. God has heard her affliction, God has seen her affliction, and her husband will get attached to me because I've borne him three sons. But it's interesting when the fourth son is born, his name deviates from the first three. Judah means let God be praised. Nothing in it about the husband. Let God be praised. She says, this time I will praise the Lord. Leah's focus changed with this child as she praises God and says nothing about Jacob. I think at this point, her focus had changed. This time I will praise the Lord. Then she has two other sons. Jacob did not love Leah, but God loved Leah. He opened her womb, giving her six sons. He turned her heart toward him, giving her something better than Jacob. And he blessed her by the Messiah coming through her son, Judah. What a blessing. God loved Leah more than Jacob could ever have loved Leah. God loves the weak the unloved, the ugly, the sinner. And God doesn't love on the basis of personality or looks or intelligence or talent or any of that. It's quite obvious in the word of God. First Corinthians 1 says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world the and the despised God has chosen. James 2 says, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? God loves the unloved. He loved Leah. He loves each one of us here. God loves us regardless of what we look like, what we, how smart we are, our personalities, and so on. And obviously, the relationship with God is more important than the relationship with a husband. And Leah learned that. That relationship with a husband is very important, and I don't want to downplay that. And Leah is not to be chastised for desiring that. And she went through a time longing for that relationship, but seems to have consoled herself at Judah's birth that God was the one who loved her unconditionally. God loved Leah and God loves you, as the following verses state so well. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 2 says, but God being in, rich in mercy because of his great love toward us,
with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trans transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. By this, the love of God was manifested, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Dear brother or sister, I don't know the depths of the trials you are facing in your marriage, in your children, in your job, in your health, in your guilt, whatever. But I do know this, that God loves you totally, unconditionally, and he wants you to know and walk in his love continually. God's love for you is greater than that of a spouse, your parents, your children. God's love for you is not based on your performance, your looks, your intelligence, your personality. God's love for you is great, surpassing our understanding. God's love is proven in that he sent his son to die for you. God's love is not fickle, loving you one minute and using the next. He's very consistent. He loves you every minute, every second. God's love is unconditional and eternal. Embrace and abide in the love of God. It will delight you now and for all eternity. Well, let me say at this point, the obvious, marry only one spouse. We have enough problems, don't we, with one spouse? Because for one thing, we're there. Marry only one spouse. That's obviously God's word. And that would have certainly curtailed a lot of problems. Think of this. Israel's 12 tribes started by 12 sons from one father and four wives. Wow. Not the best start. God is so merciful. Well, the end of the story regarding Leah and Rachel. I want you to think about this. Who was better off in the end, Leah or Rachel? Rachel steals her father's idols, not Leah. Leah is buried with Abraham and Sarah. Rachel was not. And the lineage of Christ comes through Judah, Leah's son, not Rachel's sons. I think Leah learned a lot and probably was closer to the Lord as a result of that. You reap what you sow in your life, in your children's lives, and in your testimony for God. You reap what you sow. Reap that which is good. In the morning, it's always the disappointment of Leah on this earth. Nothing in this life makes one satisfied, no matter how good. Only Christ can satisfy. Jealousy is very costly. Confess it quickly so it does not take root in bitterness. And finally, Leah found love in God and became Leah the loved. Rather than Leah the unloved, she became Leah the loved. And we're all Leah the loved. There's those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we're so blessed um, to know his love.